Hello there. So I would be describing linked lists in Perl. If I'm doing this right, everyone should now see page one. The basic problem using arrays, which are fast, they're flexible. Most of the things you want to do with them in Perl, they do work, but you have problems. You're against problems in memory management. There are problems when you iterate multiple lists at once. You've got to do a lot of bookkeeping. Also, if you're dealing with uh, lists and passing them around, restarting searches on them, maintaining the state, uh, which item you access last, what item to access next, is a lot of bookkeeping. And if you have links within an array, if you shift something onto the array, you've changed all the indexes. So it becomes hard to keep references to what you're working on. In particular, if you look at the memory issues, uh, I don't know if anyone ever saw my talk on memory manglement with Perl. That's also on SlideShare. One of the problems you have with arrays is that they get big. The, not just the data you store in them, but the actual scaffolding of the array structure itself. And without undefing it, you can't make it shrink. So you can push one item onto an array and have it double in size. Uh, Murphy's Law says that you'll have some heavily forked, long-running process, which, just as it's about to fork, is one item below where the next push doubles it. You end up copying the array every time, you have a lot of problems with memory, and you end up tearing your hair out. There's also no good way to reduce the structure of an array without undefing it, and that can be expensive because you have to rebuild the structure as you're using it. Multiple lists uh, is where I ended up writing the linked list single module because I'm using these to compare DNA sequences. You can always iterate one array easily with a for loop. But what if you have to have two? You can use indexes, but now you have different size arrays. You want to restart something earlier. It's expensive to use indexed access every single time. And it just it's a lot of extra work. And that's where I started working at linked lists, is trying to find a way to work around these problems with arrays. So linked lists trade off a couple of things. You don't have random access, you, you don't have an index, but the code for them is pretty simple. Things like push, pop, splice are easy to implement. You get better locking, which is neat for threading, or if you're using shared memory, or if you're using something that's got, even if you're doing these in C and not using Perl, uh, the locking gets a lot easier. And you get, in addition, uh, well, I'll describe skip chains, which allow you to keep references that save you from walking the entire list every time. They're easy to bookmark. So the, the classic example of insertion sorts is where you start to see linked lists in, in textbooks. Uh, the classic insertion sort takes a lot of time to take an item being inserted and push all the items past it further up the list. With a linked list, there's no cost to insert something in the middle. Things just fit. Another good example, again, is threading. Uh, if you have an array and you're about to push something onto it, pop something off, you have to lock the entire array so to avoid collisions. With a linked list, you, only, you have much better granularity. And if you have the nodes on a list, you can pass them around for comparison, update them, and they maintain enough state because they know where they are and where they're going so that you can dispatch things very easily that are performing list comparisons. So on to implementing these. The funny thing is the easiest way to do them now that I've told you array refs stink is array refs. The, the nice thing about an array is you can put pretty much anything into it. And what I'll use is a next reference and then whatever data you want. A lot of times that might be one item. It'll be a reference to something, a structure or an object. You might have a flattened out hash. You can have whatever data makes you happy on the rest of it. The 
the list always requires a head. Somewhere you've got to keep a static head to keep the structure alive. And then something to walk down the list, which I'll call a node variable. Doubly linked lists are very, not very hard in Perl, but I don't have time to describe them all here. Basically, you just need to use weak links. If you look in the pod for um, scalar util, it describes the weaken, and you just have to keep two links. This is a quick view of what a linked list looks like. So usually you'll see these in textbooks with a pointer to next at the end of the item. I'm not going to draw them that way because in Perl, they end up at the front. And that's what makes these efficient. So you've got a pointer to next followed by whatever data you want. Names, structures, objects. Adding a node is just a matter of updating some pointers. The, the first step is you create an object. So here I've got next is curly. Create a new object. I go back to Larry, I say, okay, your next is curly. And I'm sorry. And then Curly's next is Mo. That's it. That's one update right there. All it is is shifting around some pointers. Dropping a node simply recycles a next pointer. So if I've got Curly wants to point to Mo, all I do is have him point up where he wants to. The, the node for Shemp goes away because it's not referenced anymore. Perl deal, deals with it automatically. So the Perl code for this isn't complicated. If I want to create a node, I've got a node, I've got its next, and I've got whatever data I want for it. Walking the list, if I have a node variable, I can say the node and whatever data I got out is the node. And I can iterate this as many times as I want, taking the next node, expanding it, and getting the data out. Adding a new node just takes the current node's next and recycles it into whatever the, the node references and removing recycles the next pointer down one level. At that point, this isn't changing, come on. Ah, there we go. So here's an example of how to build a reverse order list. This is the least amount of work you can go through because you're not moving very much data on the list. You create a list, and the way I do these, I normally create an empty tail node. And that's a sentinel so that I know that I've hit the end of the list. There are other ways to do that where you have a circular list. You can have a, you can put a, a fixed value in there. I found the empty works fine. And then I have a node variable that starts out as the first data entry on the list. So the list is, contains, references the first entry. And then for whatever values I have, I just set the first entry in there to whatever used to be there and the next value. So what I've got is an empty tail with a bunch of items. And I'll show you in a sec what these look like in Perl. The other way you can do it is an in-order list. If you don't want to reverse your list when you're putting it on, you have to move the node up. So the list starts out the same. The node starts out in the same place. All of your values just walk up the list. I create a node with an empty and switch to it. I've shown this here as two. You can actually do this in one line. And this is what a list looks like if you view it in the Perl debugger, which shows an interesting thing about them. They're recursive. You can see here, I get the list. I've got a node. And the for 1.5 shows you the slightly golfier way to, to construct these. This is the reason that the node goes at the front. Because every time you access a node, if you expand it out, you can get the node plus however much more data you want. If you put, it this, put this at the end, you have to do all sorts of indexing to access the next node reference inside of the array. Putting it first, you don't have to. The interesting thing here, if you look at what you get out of it, and I, I've labeled 
on the right hand side you'll see where there's a list and there's all the zeros and all the zeros with ones. From Perl's point of view, the head node actually contains the second node, which contains the third node. It's a recursive structure. That becomes important in older versions of Perl. Uh, when I wrote Linkless Single, Perl 5.8 was, was out. And Perl's memory deallocator, the, the thing that runs at the end, or when something goes out of scope, was recursive. And it had a stack of 100 items. So your list would go out of scope, and if you had more than 100 items on it, you'd blow up Perl. You'd actually crash Perl itself. So the trick there was to add a destroy to the class that converted that recursive operation to an iterative one of just chewing through the list and discarding each of the items on it. As of 5.12, Perl's memory deallocator was cleaned up, and this isn't necessary any longer. But if you're using an older version of Perl, or if you look in the linked list single module on CPAN, you'll see this destroy in here, and that's, that's what it was there to deal with. So you might actually find this is all you need for a linked list class. You create something new, uh, bless the reference that contains an empty tail and whatever data you like, and use that to access the head of the list. So unshift is a pretty easy one. The head node gives you the place after which to insert new head nodes, or the, the first data entry node, whatever you want to call that. At that point, unshift just takes the list, and this is the same code we saw before for creating a reverse order list. You unshift it on and hand the list back. Taking an item off the list is the same thing we've also seen. I have the list's zero entry and some data are expanded out of the first entry. At that point, I've updated the top of the list, I've discarded the extra array ref, I've kept the data, and I can hand it back to the caller. Push is where things get to be a bit of a pain. Singly link lists. Uh, because you can't go backwards down them. You have to go to the, you start at the head and you have to go to the end of the list in order to find the place to push something on. So push really just takes the, the top of the list, walks down it, while node to zero is going to end at the very last empty array ref on the list. At that point, I populate it. Another way to do this, I could populate the node before it by looking for node to zero to zero. It's just more work, and it, it doesn't really help anything. Pop is where things become painful with singly linked lists. Uh, because if I find the end of the list, I've gone too far. I can't pop anything off. I need to find the node before the end. So at that point, I, if there's a bit of extra work, it takes two nodes with a singly linked list to do a pop. What you end up having to do is something like this. I walk down the list. Every time I go up one, I advance and keep track of where I came from. So there's a prior and a current node. At the very end of it, when the current node walks off the end of the list, the prior node is where it has to be to pop something. I can get the data, hand it back, and we're done. People that are OO purists, shield your eyes for a minute. I'll warn you when you can open them again. But one of the nice things about this structure for linked lists is it's very easy to mix OO and procedural code. The structure of an array with a next, the node variable, is just an array ref. It is, it's easy to update, it's easy to walk down the lists. That makes it easy to derive classes from linked list single or your own linked list class. It also makes it easier if you're just for speed's sake trying to get things done faster. So I can go straight into a node, I can mix the code where I need to, and again, I, when I'm doing analysis with genetics, we've got things where I'm running 32 or 40 million comparisons, I actually care about the speed. And being able to 
mix the two types of code easily without stepping on my feet has been a big help. Oh, Pyrrhus can open your eyes again. The list itself is interesting because the one node, if you think of trying to implement this with an array and an index variable, then you'd have to have two values. You'd have to pass the array around with an index. One way to do that is having offset one arrays where you store the current index of the item you're accessing in the array itself at offset zero. But then that also has all kinds of problems. Uh, the other problem you get into trying to do a lot of the things here that I'm showing you with an array is if you splice something into the middle, you don't necessarily know what to do with the index. With a linked list, a node has enough data to know where it is. You don't have to do anything extra to update it. So again, putting the link first makes it very fast to go through. I've shown one example here where if what I stored was a flattened out list of keys and values, I could get a list and walk down it getting hashes out at every step. Uh, another neat trick for this, when you do the construction, instead of copying at underscore, because you can take the first item off, you can splice an empty array ref into the first entry of at underscore. And that gives you an array of references to the original data which is neat if you're going to be modifying it later, or if that data is really big. If you're passing around large data structures, you don't have to copy them by value. For example, long DNA strings, large pieces of text, big chunks of, of large event logs. You can actually pass them by reference without having to deal with scalar refs for accessing them by splicing an empty into the first position of at underscore and using that for the node. But this is a, a a flexible thing, um, again, a lot of times I, you might store an object in the rest of this thing and you'd have node and my dollar object equal something and go along. Multiple lists is the first place I can show you something that you, just, that's a, you can do with linked lists that becomes a real pain with arrays. If I have two nodes that are off of a list and I want to compare all the things on them without using indexes, a linked list allows me to walk up the list one node at a time, dealing with the data at each point. If the lists aren't the same size, uh, I can have an if on here that will compare to the shorter. Another thing that's really nice is if I have to compare two lists that have not only different sizes, but that might be at different offsets. In genetics, you have gaps. So you might be studying something on a list, and this might also show up in an event log where you're trying to compare multiple logs for a particular type of event or an event from a particular source. You're trying to track the guy that cracked into a system on three different lists. At that point, I can say, fine, give me a node, increment them. If they're aligned, fine, keep going. If not, put both of them in and do something that realigns them. Adjust the position of node one or node two push one of them further down itself, push both of them around, get it back or give up, and now compare them and keep going. If I were using arrays for this, I'd have to have an array, an index, a separate object. It would get a lot slower and with a lot more bookkeeping. The head node at the top of this is neat. Uh, you don't access the rest of it. You normally use that for the pointer. Depending on what you want to do with this thing, you can put other things into it. You could put the length. Some classes, they will use the length or keep a reference to the node before the tail node to simplify push and pop. You can put uh, data about the list itself. I use that to keep the start and stop base numbers, species IDs, other things in the list so that I can actually have a derived class, stores whatever it needs after the first pointer, and just keeps going. Uh, now, one thing i got to warn you about, the class I just showed you really isn't good enough because it only works from the head of the node, or the head of the list, excuse me. So you'd want to be able to say something like, uh, advance the list one node, find me the current node, find me the next node, 
You don't want to always be stuck starting from the front. You'd also want to use inside-out data to store the head, to store other things about the list. The trick is if I have list equal list to zero, I've just lost the head of my list. I've actually discarded it because I no longer am referencing it. I lose track of the thing. First of all, list to zero isn't referenced. And when I update list to zero, I'm changing the ref address of the variable. So I, I can't get back to the head anymore. I don't want to actually have to store inside out data in a hash with the ref address of every single node on the list just to get back to the head. So I need a structure that I can walk up the list with it without destroying the structure. And the trick to that is, is a reference to an array ref. Because I can, a scalar ref could point to anything. I, it's, it's the ultimate container structure for Perl. So in this case, I can have a reference to the array. Now, dollar $list never moves. It's the same variable. Its contents, dollar dollar $list, are a reference to the node that I'm currently examining on the list. So now head, next, whatever, they modify dollar dollar $list. The other good thing about this is it saves blessing every node on the list to manage the list. I can have a separate class for the nodes, and the list doesn't even know about it. It's also nice when I'm resorting to procedural code because I can get the current node out of the list and just keep going. So the code to do this looks only a little bit different from what I showed the first time. There's a prototype, there's a head node. But now notice the list is a reference to the head. That backslash dollar head is going to give me a reference to an array reference. Store some inside da out data for the head, bless it and go along with life. And the destroy now has to delete the, the inside out data so that you don't lose anything. Walking the list looks about like what you've seen before. I have a list, dollar dollar list equal the head. So I take, I update dollar dollar list and hand back list. The list doesn't change. What it contains changes. It now references the head. Next, dollar dollar list and my data are returned. I don't need that separate node variable. The list knows where it is. So now I can have code like this stuff at the bottom here, where I have a list to head. And then while there's data is list to next, walk up the list, process the data. Uh, the reverse order, get a list, list to head. The head zero is head to zero, and list. So there's unshift. This is the, the reverse order list implemented with this class. Again, I only need one variable, the list. I don't need a separate node variable every time to walk it. One of the neat things about linked lists is you frequently want to be able to put things in the middle of a list. The insertion sort is the classic. So putting things in the middle, you don't want to overload push to simply add a node after the current one because you really want to have push add to the end. So you, I created add after. And all that does is take the current list location and add something after it. If there's a next node that ignores the data, it doesn't try and return it, you can have an uh, add after to next that says put something into the list, now access it for all of my data. This is the in-order building of a list. So if I have a, a next that gives back the data, I have the list. You don't want to walk off the end of the list. So if the next is false when I look at list zero, I can't go any further. I've bumped into the end. If next is empty, I'm at the end. I can't go any further. Otherwise, move to the next node and hand back the list. Add after just becomes uh, take the list, shift it, and add something here. This is all the code it takes to build in-order lists. One catch with this um, that I've done to myself any number of times, if you're going to use a linked list, the head node is not where you want to start accessing the data. So if I start with list to head and access its data, I'm going to get metadata about the list. I'm not going to get my first data node. So what I normally do in my code is I have a list to head to next or give up. If, if there's no next node, there's just nothing there to look at. And now while my data is list to next, I'm looking at my user data and walking up the list. 
Uh, and by the way, I want to leave a, a fair amount of time if people have questions. So I'm trying to move pretty quickly. If there's anything that completely confuses somebody, scream, they can, they can warn me about it. But I'd, I'd, li I'd rather have time for questions than spend too much time on these slides. You can always come back and read these later. Uh, Perl's nice because of overloading. Uh, I'd like to be able to say while there's a list, if there's a list. So there are different ways to look at this. One way is said if the Boolean is the list is true. The list has something in it. Another way would be to say at dollar dollar list, which is the list isn't empty. I'm not at the last node. Um, there are different ways I've played with this. Every time I've done it, there's an edge case that looks different. Probably everyone will come up with their own depending on how they use these. Offsets are pretty easy. If I want to increment the list, that's move that many nodes forward. Same thing. Walk up the list that many times. And if you're at the end, don't go further. If you want to increment, by, if you want to offset it by a fixed count, uh, play the game reversing the values if necessary. Take a node walk it up the list that many times, give up if you're at the end, and return. That might mean that you don't go as far as you think you do, but unlike a, an array, I won't auto, if you accidentally access linked list entry number 10,000, I won't create a huge list of empty with nothing at the end of it. An array will do that to you. So that's one other thing these are nice about, is you don't accidentally shoot yourself in the foot with flaky offsets. Updating the list is trivial. If I want to move the list node, uh, I offset the list and return. Oh, I'm sorry, list H. I, that's the variable I use. In, in There's about five typos in here that I've noticed so far. I'll correct that in the, the final version. So And then return the list. If you look in the linked list single module, it uses list H as the variable rather than list. It was list handlers so like DBH. Now, a lot of times you want to get the nodes out, but you don't want to have to peek inside of a class. That's kind of evil. So rather than assume that the caller always knows some of these things, it's easy to add a next node, cur node, root node, head node. These give you the obvious collection of entries that allow you to extract a node and then walk the list from there. The nice thing about these is I can hand you back a node, you can walk the list, and you don't affect the list itself. It stays where it was. That's great if you're trying to say, from where I am on the list now, where is the next something? How many of these do I find going forward? Am I done processing a log file? Have I found the last entry of a particular type? I can look at the current node, or the next node, walk from the next node forward, say, okay, it's time to give up, or tell you, I found the node you want, we need to update the list. So it's, it gives you a nice separation where you can investigate the list without having to update where the current node is so you can bookmark things more easily. One neat thing you have in linked lists that aren't available in arrays are skip chains. And if you think of these one way to look at them is you can have a separate linked list that points to nodes on the main list. So let's say you're doing thing uh, a large alphabetical sort. You can have a skip chain that each node has a next reference, and its data is the first node on the main list that has that letter beginning at it. I could preload my list with the letters A to Z and create a separate linked list that never changes. It always has the A to Zs. But if I want to add something with a Q, I go up the short list by first letter and then skip into the main list. Another way to do this is I can go into my linked list itself, and part of my user data can be the next node that is interesting. If I'm here and I want to, and I want to skip over something, go downstream to the next link. This is neat because if I insert new nodes in between, the reference doesn't change. Uh, so applying these things, I, I use these for the W curve code, which is used for analyzing DNA. That's where I ended up developing linked list single. The W curve analysis tool 
has to deal with different size pieces of DNA. It has to deal with gaps where the offsets change between the lists. And when I'm realigning things, I have to find interesting points where I want to try and realign rather than go through one thing at a time. That's where all this came from. The, the nodes are nice because I can offset them. Skip chains, I'll show you how I generate those, give me a skip ahead list so that I can go quickly to the next place for making an alignment. The other nice thing about the list is if I want to update something on a node, if I want to change the order of things, I can do it without affecting the list object itself. So the list can say, I'm starting my comparison here. I can use nodes to walk up and down, make sure I've, I've found what I need to. And when I'm done, I say, OK, the list has to move to this next section. So the, the list variable, without having to clone it, I can walk up the list to analyze it. So the, initializing one of these W-curve things um, has some DNA. It's, all of these things are geometry at, that's stored in cylindrical notation with a radius and an angle and a z-value. So it's a, it's a long cylinder. And the whole point of the W-curve is it converts the DNA sequence into geometry that's easier to analyze. And they all start at 0, 0, 0. So I call truncate. You can imagine what truncate does. It just calls head and then undef, you know, sets the zero node to an empty array. Bang. The rest of it goes away. Well, there's, a, well, there's some DNA. Generate the next point and add it after the current node and go to the next node. And finally, return the W curve. All this does is populate the thing. You'll notice, though, I generate there's a point, and then right after that, there's an empty string. That's where my skip chain's going to go. Rather than push it on and, and change the size of the arrays, I just leave an empty filler there. So what happens is that the skip chain is about looking for places in the curve where the radius is larger than a cutoff, let, you know, let's say 0.5. That's a sparse list, and it saves me from analyzing every single entry on the array. So what I do is I build a skip chain of the next node on the list that has a radius larger than 0.5. It might be the next node. It might be 10 down there. Who knows? I use an inchworm, what I call, there's probably a technical term for it, that walks one node up. It finds the next interesting node, takes all the nodes behind it, sets their skip chain equal to itself, and then walks up again. So one way to do that, this is Perl, there's always more than one. I start with a list. I get the head node. I set the skip equal to the head node's first reference. And for as many items as there are on the list, I find that this, this next node is interesting, or I skip the continue block moves me up. Eventually, I find what is interesting, while the node is not equal to the skip, I walk up. Uh, Perl is nice that, like C, if I compare two references, if they are not referring to the same thing, they will compare different. So in this case, that takes all of the nodes behind this one and sets them equal to this one, and then walks this node further up until it finds something interesting. I could do this with two while nodes. I could move the skip up until it matches, and then move the other node. It, it, same result. And there we go. Now, the, the problem I've got is that the DNA sequences get offset their gaps. You might have a bunch of DNA on one side that doesn't exist on the other, and I still need to keep comparing it, which is why I can't use indexes. So the nice thing is, a linked list, I can realign it by passing the nodes in, resetting a couple of nodes, and then going again. I don't have to modify the object. I don't have to worry about storing last use indexes, because again, the, the node has enough state about where it is that I don't need to pull extra data around with it. So to compare a list, I start with a couple of, uh, I'm skipping a bunch of setup code here. I've got a couple of nodes. While there's something there, I realign them. I ask, you know, are these reasonable to compare to one another? I compare the ones that are aligned 
and then add the score. If the score is defined, then I save the location I stopped comparing back into the lists. And then the caller gets back the score and where I stopped comparing. Note that if the score is useless, if these weren't comparable at this point, I don't update the list. And the caller gets told, you know, you've got nothing for the score, and they don't have to worry about bookkeeping where the list started for themselves. They just, they are where they are. So comparing two things that are aligned, if I get a couple of nodes, I can say, the di I compute the distance between whatever the node data is, or I give up, add it, and increment the nodes. If I can't compare them, if the distance is undefined, the caller gets back what I got and where I gave up. Again, the nodes make this easy because they know where they are. I can pass them around without any extra data. So another, other things you can do with linked lists is store trees. If you think about it, I can have a linked list whose data is the head of a linked list, which gives me a tree-ish behavior. Uh, the nice thing about that is if you use arrays for the trees, if you use hashes for the trees, you store an enormous amount of extra data because sparse trees will end up with eight keys even if you don't need them. You still have the collision chains, and you've got to compute the hash entries every time you access them. You can do the same thing with arrays by storing a list of children, and then each child references a list of children. But if you need to balance the tree, you're stuck using splice and split, and, and you end up with pro possibly a lot of wasted data space for empty array entries. With linked lists, all you need to do to balance a tree is move one reference and go along with your life. Two-dimensional lists get interesting. If each node, ha again, has its data a linked list, I can store a grid. If you look at four-way linked lists, I have uh, not just a doubly linked list with a, a parent and a child at each point, but I can have an up, a down, a left, and a right link. That's the guts of a spreadsheet. The great thing about these is I can insert a column or a row without having to change all the references. I can delete columns or rows and return data to the heap in Perl. A, and the other nice thing about the multiply linked lists, if you think of them as skip chains, you can jump, make immediate jumps just about anywhere on the list. And you can add you know, a third dimensional, you can have sheets of spreadsheet-ish kind of data. These are actually rather nice if you're dealing with some of the, the statistical data you get out of things like R. Uh, it, it makes it easier to walk around the data and examine it. Uh, work queues, another classic thing you have for, for these is you can have multiple threads. One thing is pushing work on, another thing is consuming the work. You might not be first in, first out. It might be priority, you might have uh, things going out that take different amounts of time to finish, and when something comes back, you update it and send it back. Circular lists are a slight variation of what I've shown here. Instead of having a an empty node at the end, I have a node that points to the head. These are great for queues because one thing can sit at the head pushing things on. Another thing can walk down the list saying, you know, find me the, find me the next thing that's interesting to process. And the one that's processing never has to check for end of list because it'll go on forever. The and, and here's another typo, because you can see that for one dot dot three, but you see this has got five entries on it. I, I actually pasted this out of two debugger sessions. Sorry about that. But I start with a list. I start with a head node. I do everything you saw before, but you notice my list starts out as itself for the head node. And then for one to three, pretend that says five. You get... The same structure we saw before, it's nested, it's got the same basic layout, but when you get to that inner piece, you get a reused address, and you'll notice that that 87 delta 00 is the first array. That's all it takes. One thing you notice, though, is if you don't weaken 
the copy of list that's held in the tail. This will never go out of scope. It'll keep itself alive. That's the bane of reference counting. So either weaken it or use this in situations where you don't care. It's going to last as long as the process. So anyway, I, the nice thing about linked lists, they can be very lazy. You can use them in a lot of cases where the node variables contain enough state that you're not banging your head against indexes everywhere. Uh, singly linked lists are easy to write. The code for them is simple to understand. Doubly linked lists only take a little bit more in weakening a backlink and, and deleting two things. And the trade-off for random access is actually pretty good, especially in memory allocation where you can avoid a lot of fragmentation. Uh, that's one of the reasons actually they use linked lists in the regex engines and the Perl compiler itself builds the opcodes as a linked list of opcodes because that makes it very easy to optimize things in chunks, reorder them, take things out, whatever you need to, without having to reallocate because you know down there you're in, Perl, in C, not Perl. So without having to realloc and malloc and adjust all your buffer space, you can have a large heap, allocate a lot of things in it, and not have to worry nearly as much about memory management. And again, threads, these are, there are a lot of examples of this on the net where you can use linked lists to avoid locking issues in threads. And that's it. So if people are still awake, uh, I'm here. Thank you so much, Stephen, for sharing such fascinating information and your knowledge and expertise today. Folks, we are at Q&A, and what that means is if you have not opened your group chat widget, please open it. Type in a question if you have it for Stephen and what he's been talking to you about and showing you today. We will take as many as we have time for, and we'll give folks a moment um, on the event to send their questions in. But it looks like Audra has received a few questions via Twitter, so we'll turn it to Audra. Hello. So Aaron would like to know how you can reserve a linked list in Perl. How I can reserve? Yes. I'm not sure what he's asking. I'm not sure either. If you want to pre-allocate a list, if you want to pre-allocate a linked list, just build it with empty data. Um, I mean, that's the classic way to do it. There is actually one gotcha in in the simple examples I showed here. Is most of these use if at dollar data or next? That obviously will give you a runt read on the list if you have a node without data on it. But you know, aside from that, if, if you wanted to pre-allocate a list with umpteen entries on it, just store nothing for the data. If that didn't answer your question, to try it again. I just, I'm not sure I know what reserved meant. Uh, there's also a question there? from Bob. Uh, Bob would like to know if you could talk a little about a C-link list from Perl XS. Doing this, and actually, it would be about as trivial as they get. The nice thing is, because this is an array, uh, I wouldn't use XS. I'd actually use inline C, because you can pass an array of uh, a Perl array into a C struct very, very easily with inline. It will build the interface for you. If you knew that the linked list was passing in and out, a standard issue C struct, then all you'd have to do is the the C linked list uh, would be converted on the Perl side. The pointer would be a reference, and the data value, the, the struct that you're using in C would just be an array of data. And again, if if you use the inline module, any mixture of ints, floats, care stars will be automatically converted to the right types of scalars in Perl. So you could have a C struct with a, um, a void, you know, void star next and whatever pieces you wanted and the excess to copy that back up uh, would just have to create the right, you know, SVs of the right type, which inline will do for you automatically. And it gives you back the array ref. So as far as the the Perl side of it goes, it, by looking at just arrays, the interface is down to C is very easy. 
All right, thank you so this much. Is where actually being able to talk to people would be helpful because <laughs> I can't tell if I'm answering the questions. Yeah, we're um, our audience looks a little bit quiet right now, so we're just giving him a moment here. Um, again, folks, if there is a question you have for Stephen, he is live with us on the line, so he can take it, uh, open the group chat, type it in, send it in. Uh, we'll give folks just a few more minutes because we do still have time. But Stephen, I wanted to ask you if you could share with us a little bit about what are the things, maybe new projects or any new directions perhaps um, – Pearl is going or what the community is seeing or what they're working on and what direction um, they see the future as being? Well, uh, leaving the hand wringing out of it, one of the neat things about Pearl right now is that as much as a lot of people don't like Pearl 6 because they think of it as a distraction, a lot of interesting things have come back to Pearl from Pearl 6 because it gave people a uh, sort of a blank slate to experiment on. Uh, tonight at the Pearlmongers, I'm giving a talk on regex grammars, which was Damien Conway's. It's really not a back port of Perl 6 grammars because the syntax is a little bit different, but he managed to put the same basic idea of a grammar defined inside of a regular expression with Perl code blocks to manipulate it as need be and the structure, the syntax for that came back from the way he did it in Perl 6. The, you know, a lot of things, the recursive matching, uh, smart matching, whether you like it or didn't, you know, it officially went away with 5.18. It, it's now a, uh, a dead end. But a lot of those experiments came from Perl 6 and, and people using it. So it's, you know, a lot of the direction is finding ways to make Perl look, you know, part of it is, is, is absorbing good ideas from other languages. Uh, one project I'm trying to start here in St. Louis, and anyone wants to help, is to create some more of the tool sets of something, Poe does everything Node.js will do, but you have to know a little bit more about Perl to use it. So trying to come up with a a container for all of that that looks a lot like Node.js that uses Perl so that you're, you're just using an object that does all the, the real work for you. I think if we come up with more tools like that rather than modules that implement features, uh, it'll make it easier for people to use Perl. Is anyone awake out there or no? Any I'm not seeing any feedback from our folks. Uh, they're still there chatting away. And actually, if you were talking about starting a Perlmongers group um, in their area, so folks, <laughs> again, you have what, are, what area is the, what area is that? I'm not seeing this chat. I guess that's just because I'm in a different. Yeah, it's a different view. Oh, let's just go up oh. and a peek. Um, I'll find it for you right away. And again, folks, we still are on the line. If you do have a question, let us know. He is, where is he, in Des Moines, Iowa. Oh. That's not that far. <laughs> Probably a bit, a bit far to drive for the St. Louis Perlmongers. Yeah. Um, one idea if you're trying to create a Perlmongers group, there, there's a thing I'm trying to convince O'Reilly to do uh, that people can do by themselves. If you go to SlideShare and look me up, there are a bunch of talks about Perl there. If anyone ever wants to use those for a local Perlmongers meeting, go ahead. I think if we come up with one of the biggest problems creating the groups and getting people to talk at them is that most people aren't willing to spend the time, they don't have it, to really create a decent set of slides. And most of the groups end up being the same four or five people talking you know, all year long. I think if, if we had a sort of a library of, of talks, even if people didn't give all of them, you could use sort of a Creative Commons type thing where you could at least start with something, and that might make it a lot easier for people to, to describe stuff. I don't know if that sounds interesting to anyone. But I'm gonna, folks, I'm going to push out the link to – we pushed out the link, first of all, and it's also in your resource widget to the slides that you saw today. So Stephen has made today's slides available via his um, SlideShare account. Plus, I'm going to push out to you all where he's got all of the rest of his talks he just told you about, so you can take a peek at them. And wow, lots of good information there. 
Uh, well, the other thing too is I'll be putting some correct. There were a couple of errors I noticed in this one, uh, so I will be pushing a corrected version of this out tonight. If anyone Perfect. cares, <laughs> is anyone? I, I can't see. Is anyone still awake out there? Yeah, I mean we've got people from the Netherlands. <laughs> hello, all the way in the Netherlands. Oh, hello I there. Like there, and uh, they're telling us. So, they're yeah, awake. it's the middle of the night for you guys. <laughs> And other folks are awake, but it just doesn't look like they have questions. So um, with that, folks, we just want to let you know, those of you who are going to be in the Portland, Oregon area next month, July 22nd through the 26th, you can see Stephen live. He's going to be talking at O'Reilly's flagship conference, OzCon. It's our open source event, and it's a lot of fun. He's going to be there live again. And we do still have some tickets available, so we do invite you all to um, – Purchase your tickets and go see the talks and meet Stephen. He can shake his hand, and um, I'm sure he'd love to chat There's with one you. other great thing. Yeah. One other really great thing is there, there's a, a protest against high oil prices called the World Naked Bike Ride. And, in fact, the largest one is in Portland, Oregon. So if you wanted to, to participate in possibly the – the largest, or at least watch, the largest um, naked political protest in the country, if not the world, uh, it, it will be the, the evening after OSCON in Portland. That sounds exciting. Little did you realize the things you could see. <laughs> oh, we do. Let's see here. Okay, folks are now starting to send in some um, comments and questions Questions, here. okay. We do have Wayne, and Wayne says um, he seems applicable – to complex file diff problems. So I guess he's commenting on what you're talking yes. about. And then Theo says he just needs it to settle down and see a good purpose to use this old school techniques. So Well, the, 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 it's not a matter of old school versus new school. Code is never better than the data structures that support it. If what you're trying to do is manipulate a lot of small atomic units that have to be reordered and you don't want them grouped as a single item. You want to be able to manipulate them separately. Then you don't want an array, because to manipulate one piece of an array, you end up manipulating all of it. That means, for example, if you're threading. In a threaded application, you have to lock an entire array before you do anything with it so that nobody else mangles the offsets. With a linked list, you only have to lock one pointer. So if you have multiple things accessing the list, you get much better concurrency. Another thing is that if you're doing arrays to deal with things that get resorted frequently, you either have to buffer the array, which requires twice as much space, or you end up doing a lot of onesie twosie exchanges down the length of it, and it becomes a lot of bookkeeping, a lot of code overhead. With a linked list, you can switch two items on the list by just changing a couple of pointers. The other advantage is that linked lists do not cause nearly as much memory fragmentation. You can allocate a single heap for a linked list in you know, C or use Perl's heap. If I take something off the list, it goes back into the heap. If I'm using roughly similar sized things on my list, I don't need space for a thousand and one of them to push one more item onto a list of a thousand items. I only need space for one link. So the discontiguous memory, the fact that I can modify one piece of the list without overriding all of it. Again, if I've got something that forks heavily and I modify an array, I can end up modifying all of the array if Perl wants to copy it because it thinks the array needs more space that can end up causing a lot of problems with copy on write. Whereas a linked list, I'm, I'm updating atomic pieces of data, so there's a lot less memory movement. And because of that, they can actually be faster than arrays for a lot of things. If, if you were in C and you had a bunch of pointer math, then it's easy to have arrays of structs and use multiple pointers to walk up them. But you don't, in higher level languages, you don't actually have pointers, and a reference to an array can't walk inside of the array. It represents the entire array as a unit. So now you have to play index games. Well, comparing multiple lists to one another, 
I can do that using a linked list without having to maintain a separate set of array variables and index variables. It's also nice, again, because if I insert something into an array, all of my offsets have to be changed, which means they have to be saved in one place where an array manager can say, oops, I put something into offset 6. I'd better take you know, anything that referenced 6 and up, and I'd better up them by 1. With a linked list, if I insert something into the list, no one with existing references knows or cares. I have to be careful taking them out of the list, but that's actually not that hard to manage if, if you use Sentinels. So there, there's, it's easier to manage for things where the list is more dynamic. It takes less code, and you tear out less of your hair getting it finished. Alrighty, folks. And with that, we thank you, Stephen, for sharing all your knowledge. Ooh, here we go. <laughs> Nick Jennings. One more question. Here. Yes. Do you recommend normally using linked lists instead of arrays? No. Uh, I mean, linked lists, my linked lists are based on array refs. The arrays are wonderful for what they're good at, which is the 90% you know, of things that you see out there. The linked list is, it has a specific use. So I wouldn't go around replacing all your arrays with linked lists. But if you're staring at some code that looks really ugly and is passing around indexes and is doing splice a lot and has to copy arrays onto arrays to deal with splicing and, and you're, every time you try and compare two of these, you go crazy because they're something at index 5 on one is at index 7 on the other and you're banging your head out trying to make all the indexes line up, you're using the wrong data structure. An array isn't made for that. At that point, the linked list is going to be a lot easier for you. So, I mean, if, if the arrays work, use them. But this, this, it's just a different data structure that makes a few things easier that you don't always have to do, but when you have to do them, arrays just don't work. Stephen, a couple more questions came in as well. Um, could, have sure. different, uh, could have different levels of linked lists say, a list of words within a list of sentences within a list of pages? Sure. A couple of ways to do that. If, if you're using this for parsing, you can have one linked list of sentences. And if the data portion of the first linked list, called it the top level linked list uh, from my sentence, is a linked list of words, I can, I can sub-parse the top level into to subunits if I want to rearrange the words and examine them separately. Um, another way to do it is that, let's say you've got, you know, if you're doing statistical analysis of William Shakespeare, you can create a linked list of lines from, from plays. And if, you know, at each chapter heading, you can have a separate linked list that has the starting point of each chapter or act, you could have a separate linked list. Uh, if I have one linked list of all the lines in a play, I can have multiple other linked lists where the data on each one of them are references to the successive lines by one of the, the actors. So one of the great things about this is it's really easy to have multiple lists referencing the same data, where if you, again, if you did it with arrays, you'd have to copy everything. Um, or what I, you know, if you spreadsheets do this because you've got a four-way linked list. Every every entry on the list has not just a next pointer, but a left and a right and above and a below. So if you wanted to break things down that way, you could actually have linked lists of of individual words. Um, but yeah, if, if you're using this for a parsing type of thing, which is what Perl uses it for, building opcodes, you end up with a linked list of, let's say, sentences. And the data for each one of these is a linked list of words. And that allows you to go down, index the sentences pretty quickly, and then look down the words to see what you're finding. You could even then, if you wanted to find specific words, you could have a separate linked list of all the places a particular word appears on the, on the, the larger list and walk down all the occurrences of that word looking for what word follows it. 
Also, Theo stepped in a little late and just saw a bit about reverse traversing, but why no double list that does the reverse order? Because, okay, doubly linked, I, I pointed out early, doubly linked lists require more explanation, and I just didn't have time to get through it. A doubly linked list has a pointer to next and a pointer to previous. And the trick there is that you have to weaken the pointer to the previous entry if you want the list to ever go out of scope. Uh, aside from that, if you look at the code for a doubly linked list, you've got two entries at the head. You've got next and prior, or I usually call them prior and after because the words line up in the code. So if I've got a prior pointer and an after pointer, or a reference, and then some data. And then what happens is prior comma after comma at data equals at dollar after. If I'm walking forward, if I'm walking backwards, I use at dollar prior to set all three of them. The trick is the, the pointer to next and the pointer to previous end up at the front of the list. If you do that, then expanding it by just using at dollar node will move both pointers into where they belong and extract your data in one set. So yeah, there, there's no reason you can't use doubly linked lists and probably work just fine. In fact, if you've got a list that you know is going to last as long as your program does, you might not even have to worry about weakening the links. You just have to be careful to update the before and after links every time you remove something. It's a little more bookkeeping because if I want it, if I got three nodes in order, A, B, and C, and I want to remove node B, I have to update two pointers. I have to update the after pointer in A and the before pointer in B. So there's just more operations. They're not surprisingly different from what you saw here in the singly linked lists, but I just don't, I barely made it through the slides as it was. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Stephen, again for presenting a really fascinating webcast for us all, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us, and to for going into detail with the questions and talking about the future of Perl. We do Why thank you hell? so much for that. <laughs> Folks that attended today, we do thank you for attending our webcast and hope you benefited from it. And for those of you that did send in your questions, thank you for those because having those questions really does add so much to our events. Again, we would like to let you know that Stephen is speaking live at our OSCON conference next month in Portland. We did push out some details to you on that. So if you are in the area, please, we invite you to stop by, um, check out our event, and we are most convinced that you're going to learn a lot. Stephen, again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. This will conclude our webcast. Goodbye, everybody. Have a good day.